Great, thanks, Niels. And uh, yeah, can I just say for myself, you know, being a work package leader in both projects, it's really gratifying now to see um, the culmination of these projects after quite a long journey. And uh, yeah, it's been really productive. So uh, thank you both for your leadership. Um, so today I'm going to talk about work package seven in Jonas, which is really about uh, indicators. This is really building on the work that um, that uh, Florent and Thomas have just been talking about. Um, so I'll firstly talk a bit about the objectives of Work Package 7, try and keep it as quick as possible so we've got some time for, uh, for questions. Um, and yeah, talking a bit about the OSPAR impulsive noise indicator, which we kind of adapted for the purposes of continuous noise. And I'll try and focus on the worked examples, which are the most uh, interesting part. So the Work Package 7 objectives um, are really to come up with a management indicator for continuous noise, which um, is going to be compatible with Descriptor 11 and the OSPAR indicators, and be sensitive to the kind of regional, sub-regional specificities that we see in the uh, Atlantic area, i.e. large area, deep ocean, um, and, and species that we don't see so much in the North Sea, like baleen whales. So this work really began in 2019. So be before we had the OSPAR indicator, before we had uh, the 2022 uh, MSFD advice. So we're, uh, fortunately, it seems like things have converged. Um, but you'll see so some of this stuff uh, does go over similar ground uh, for that reason. Uh, there's also the RAGES risk assessment that was done, um, which had some interesting methodological uh, outputs as well. Um, so in terms of the way that uh, management people think, the DAPSIR framework is very much a kind of generic framework which is followed and which it's, it's good for us to try and uh, express our results in terms of. So DAPSIR is man-made drivers which lead to, uh, which, so sectors like oil and gas or offshore wind which lead to human activities like seismic, seismic air gun uh, surveys or pile driving which create pressures in the form of noise and affect the ecosystem leading to impacts and um, possibly a management response if it's deemed necessary, which then act on the drivers and activities. So uh, already with an OSPAR, we had um, a, a pressure indicator for uh, impulsive noise. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then a, a risk of impact indicator uh, also for impulsive noise, which combines these uh, states and uh, impact sections. So as Frank was showing first thing, uh, this is a kind of fairly simplified uh, version of what, what we've all been showing in terms of risk mapping. Um, essentially, we have uh, a management area. This happens to be the, the North Sea, I suppose, which isn't necessarily most Jonas appropriate. Um, but we have pressure from uh, impulsive noise here uh, the state information here is a, the distribution of harbor porpoise. And then when we combine these two maps, we get a risk map. And the, the novel aspect, which we've heard from the last couple of uh, talks, is these uh, exposure curves, expo exposure indices, which are describing the percentage of the, the population or, or the area which is exposed and the percentage time. So within, within OSPAR, of course, this was done with um, a good deal of rigor and, and there's, a different, there's a kind of nine stage process and um, Jakob went through that for, uh, the, uh, for that indicator. Just a little bit about the exposure index and the exposure curves before we move on. Um, basically, for those of you who are less familiar, um, what, what it shows us is the area under this curve of percentage population exposed and percentage time and then this quite kind of psychedelic one here, we can kind of see how it's scaled. People have scaled these differently, I should add. Uh, the way that we've decided to do it uh, is from zero to 100. And it's somewhat intuitive because an exposure index of 100 means that 100% of the time, 100% of the area was exposed. And so as in this example where we have 12, that means that that's the same amount of exposure as 12% of the area being exposed 12% of the time. Okay, so we had that framework for impulsive noise and we needed to adapt it for continuous. 
Um, the, the data sources are different. The, uh, we're looking more at masking than displacement, uh, and it's chronic rather than discrete. So there, there are quite some differences to look at. The main challenge is what is the pressure metric, and this is what we've been hearing uh, in terms of the ship noise excess level. Um, we considered three different options. We can just look at the total noise level and, and look at a cap on that, and, and actually some contracting parties within OSPAR are, are still advocating for this kind of approach, um, but it doesn't account for the natural background noise. Um, you can also do something called a range reduction factor, which looks at a specific frequency and under certain assumptions, it tells you how much uh, a communication signal would be reduced in range by noise. But um, we went for a, a metric which is, I think, slightly different to what's been described so far, which is the broadband uh, ship noise excess level, which integrates over a wider frequency band than just one, one single frequency. And it'll be interesting in the discussion to get into um, the extent to which that's, that's an advantage or not. So I'll, in the interest of time, spare you too much detail, just to say that um, if there's audiogram information available, then we can include that. But actually, the species which don't have audiograms are baleen whales and fish, which tend to be most sensitive at low frequencies. And the ship noise excess level is also highest at low frequencies. So that, that tends to work out quite well. All right, so for these examples, we were kind of working in parallel to the ship noise mapping that was being done in Jonas. So we didn't, we didn't have those available to, to work up some of these examples. So we've used some modeling that was done uh, by CFAS in collaboration with Marine Scotland, um, looking at 2017. Um, so nicely on a, on a joint Jonas, Jomo Pans meeting, it happens that this, this covers some both areas, which um, will hopefully continue with our harmonization work. So looking first at fin whales, um, this is a distribution of fin whales from uh, Waigat et al uh, on the bottom right. Um, so we see offshore in those deeper areas. So combining it with the pressure metric, uh, we get a risk map similar to um, what Thomas was showing us. And then um, these uh, exposure curves where uh, th that green line is our kind of 20 decibel um, 20, 20 decibel ship noise excess uh, metric, which is the one that we've, we've used uh, similarly to uh, Jakob. And we can do the same for sperm whales. The distribution is slightly different. It's a bit uh, distributed a bit, a bit further north. We get a fairly similar look looking uh, risk map um, and exposure curves. So this is the definition of the indicator which we came up with. Um, I'd say it is compat compatible with the latest uh, 2022 guidance, which introduces a lot of new terms. I don't know if everyone's read it cover to cover, but um, terms like tolerable impacted area and tolerable duration. Um, so the way to think about this is that um, effectively the level of onset of biologically significant adverse effects, which is this kind of... Uh, noise threshold at which it's considered effects could occur. Uh, if we consider that to be a 20 decibels of ship noise excess, then this indicator and indeed the, the Jomo Pans indicator fall within that. And one way to think about thresholds, it would be a, 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 a dot on the, um, on the exposure curve graph. So in this example, uh, just, to, just by way of example, um, 30% of the area, 30% of the time, could be a potential um, threshold, and that's what it would look like. And so in, in, the, in the case here, um, you know, it's exceeding it at the moment, but if that curve went underneath it, then it would be compliant. And in terms of the OSPAR indicator, uh, it's very much uh, along similar lines. One thing that we need to figure out is this definition of the ship noise uh, excess level and how specifically we do that. Because, um, yeah, there's some interesting, interesting details for um, the people who do the calculations. So all of this is in uh, the D7.3 report. Um, I do have a little bit on cumulative stuff, which I could go on to, but uh, I will leave it to the chair if we have time or not. It would be two, minutes, yes. two or three minutes. Okay. Um, so this bridges a little bit with our next section. Um, but basically... 
uh, we have a task within work package eight, which is to look at uh, a cumulative uh, assessment of a particular area. So bringing in uh, impulsive noise as well as continuous noise and looking at how we might present that information to a manager. So using the same uh, continuous noise um, data as before, but bringing in this uh, impulsive noise data. So this is all OSPAR work. Um, I'm one of the, the co-conveners of the ICG noise, uh, leading on the impulsive noise work. And we've been monitoring this since 20, 2015. So what we did was with this 2017 map of um, shipping noise, we actually decided to look at 2017 in terms of impulsive noise as well. It happened to be a more interesting year, frankly. Uh, there was some seismic survey off of um, Ireland and um, some other, I can't remember what that is, uh, off of um, Portugal and Spain. So uh, quite a bit of acti activity in the Atlantic area. Um, and we just created this arbitrary uh, management area just to, to illustrate. So we have um, seismic surveys uh, in of Irish waters, some acoustic deterrent device, or that's Navy activity actually, uh, some explosions of uh, French coastal waters, and so on and so forth. So, so quite a range of activity in, in terms of impulsive. And then on the um, shipping noise side, we have, um, as you'd expect, a lot of activity in the English Channel, and I think, I think that's Cork there. So there we are. Um, so for fin whales, um, you know, we, we create risk maps for both types, um, and what we can do is look at the monthly exposure indices um, and think about what this might mean for management. So on the left, we have the impulsive, on the right, we have the continuous. And so it's a very um, seasonal variation for the impulsive because these are discrete events. The work tends to be done in the summer, whereas it's more consistent for the uh, continuous noise activity. And so there's a question, you know, as managers, would we want to try and schedule seismic air gun surveys at particular times uh, when there's less shipping noise, or is it better when it happens when there's more shipping noise? We can see, for example, that in, in February and March, we have a, a minimum both for uh, continuous noise and impulsive noise. And, you know, people talk about quiet, protected areas, you know, um, trying to have times when there's, there's no activity rather than trying to, to spread it all out. So. Um, these kinds of plots allow us to look at um, the timing and, and potentially the, the spatial uh, management as well. All right, I will leave it there so we have time for questions and skip through these. And thank you very much.